It's nice to be here. I have so many uh, folks who have, I've intersected with in various parts of my life, including, as John mentioned, going way back to medical school. I also have a lot of colleagues here from Society of General Internal Medicine, so, and a lot of former UCSF folks who have come here. So I feel um, very much at home. Um, I know it's not in good taste to joke about the weather in Seattle, but I was talking to my wife this morning and told her I came here to get away from the rain because we have just been drenched with tremendous storms in uh, Northern California the last few days. The commute has been just awful, and it was a, seemed to be a beautiful day here today. So thank you for that. Appreciate it. So I'm going to talk about mentoring. My disclosure si slide was already up. I have no disclosures to disclose, no conflicts of interest. All right, so I want to, here's a very brief outline, and John did mention my connection with Japan. I actually spent a year on sabbatical in Kyoto, uh, Japan, at Kyoto University, where I was studying mentorship in academic medicine in the Japanese context, sort of bringing in my background in anthropology with my current interests. So there'll be some photos from Japan kind of sprinkled throughout. This is one of my favorite temples in Kyoto, particularly in, in the fall. Um, for anybody going to Japan, I love giving travel advice uh, about what to see particularly while you're in Kyoto. So here's an outline, brief overview or outline of the talk. Why mentoring? What is the evidence? I know we're an evidence-based group, and I'm only going to spend a couple of minutes on this because there's a lot of uh, single-site, cross-sectional descriptive studies, but they add up to the preponderance of the evidence as mentoring matters, and it's something that uh, we should all be thinking about implementing. How do we implement? How do we do it better? How do we study it? But I'll go over a little bit of evidence. Um, spend some time on what is it? What is this thing we call mentoring? Uh, how do we define it? What are the competencies? And then I want to spend a little time telling you about UCSF and some of the things that we've um, done there. John alluded to the mentor development program that we've had on, as part of the our uh, CTSI for the last decade. There have been another um, a number of other ini initiatives that we've implemented that may be of interest to you as you kind of get the ball rolling here at UW. <clears throat> Sorry, I'm also, been, I have been traveling quite a lot and I'm battling still some kind of horrible sinus post-nasal thing, so I apologize if there's some unpleasant sounds emanating uh, uh, while I'm talking. <clears throat> so there's an oldest systematic review uh, still often referenced about uh, the impact of mentorship, this, uh, look, looking at a number of cross-sectional studies from students, trainees, and faculty. And what this found was that having a mentor seems to make a difference in terms of career guidance and career choice for students and residents uh, around retention and recruitment of faculty. It costs a lot of money to bring faculty and train them, train them up. Uh, having a mentoring program helps keep them happier, more productive, you know, more likely to retain them, uh, kind of the business case for mentorship. And also leads to increased productivity of students and faculty um, as this also shows, this is a number of studies of junior faculty mentoring junior faculty with mentors uh, and fellow junior faculty and fellows have increased publications, more grants, better research skills, improved academic leadership skills, increased understanding of academic values, etc. And I'll just show you one um, study from our own institution from a few years back. Uh, actually, Pat Arian, who's now here also at UW, I'll see tomorrow when I talk to psychiatry, was a co-author on this. We found in a, looking at our faculty, and those faculty who have mentors reported greater academic self-efficacy, that is, they had a, a better, more confidence that they knew what they needed to do to succeed, to get advanced and promoted at UCSF, um, and higher satisfaction with time allocation at work. That is, if they spent more time doing research more, or more time in clinical care, whatever it was, they were more satisfied with how they were spending their professional, their lot, the time in their professional lives if they had a mentor. So interesting, I think, provocative uh, finding. <clears throat> so what is this thing we call mentoring? I'm going to show you a definition. It's a little laborious. I'm going to pull it apart in a second. There's a number of definitions out there. I do some work with the National Research Mentoring Network, which I'll tell you about later. They're about to come out with their own definition of mentoring. That's yeah, a little bit of how many angels dance on the head of a pin, but I think it's important when we talk about this concept that, we have, that we're all sort of talking about the same thing. 
I like this one because it's a more generic, I think broadly applicable definition. This is from Lois Zachary um, in a book called Creating a Mentoring Culture. She says that mentoring is a reciprocal and collaborative learning relationship between two or more individuals who share mutual responsibility and accountability for helping a mentee work toward achievement of clear and mutually defined learning goals. Okay, even I have not been able to memorize that one yet. Um, but I do, so I want to kind of break it down for you because I think there's some important concepts embedded in this definition. So first she says it's reciprocal and collaborative learning relationship. Reciprocal, and there are other definitions of mentorship that include this, this idea of reciprocity in the definition. And in many ways, I think this is a key concept that makes mentorship quite different from other professional relationships, teaching, coaching, counseling, advising, et cetera, where the, it's not, there's not an expectation of reciprocity built in to the relationship because perhaps those are not relationships in the same way that a mentoring relationship is. That is, one would expect and hope that this that this relationship will uh, be sustained over time, develop like other relationships. It's not a personal relationship necessarily, it's a professional one, but if you're gonna have a, uh, a relationship that's sustained, there needs to be some sense of reciprocity in that. This is something we can talk more about later if you like. The collaborative piece comes to this idea of a mentoring team, and we actually spent a lot of time at UCSF early on uh, when we were putting this program together for the CTSI, trying to figure out what do we mean that's not just a mentor, there are different roles and responsibilities. We came up with three very simple subtypes. One is a research or scholarly mentor. Could maybe uh, scholarship of discovery or maybe scholarship of integration. So these are research or scholarly mentor a career mentor who may or may not have the same content area or uh, expertise as their mentee. It may be someone uh, in their department, generally department or division, or uh, who understands what it takes to get ahead in their particular um, career niche, uh, but isn't necessarily working with them on, on their research pro project. This intensity of this relationship may be less, two or three meetings a year perhaps, sometimes more. Uh, this one generally is more intense if you're trying to get stuff done. And then this third kind of mentor is a co-mentor. This might be the bio, in, a, in a research context, maybe the biostatistician on the team, where meetings may be quarterly, a little bit less intense, but this person's a mentor because they're also committed to the uh, career development of this mentee. They're not just there to provide advice and say, see you later, good luck. They're in part of the team. Again, the sense of reciprocity, you notice the arrows go both ways here. You also notice that the mentee is at the center of this. And as a general internist, I see everything through the lens of my training in general internal medicine. So this is like patient-centered care. You know, this is mentee-centered mentoring. This is really the way to make mentoring successful is to think about the mentee at the center of this. And then we have peer mentors, very important, but perhaps not as much in this inner circle, and advisors and others, of, of course, who are influencing. So speaking of peer mentoring, another image from my time in Japan, this is the palace in Kyoto where the emperor lived, moved out a couple hundred years ago, which in Japanese history is like yesterday. Um, a beautiful place. And the Japanese often, when they talk about mentorship, they don't have the word mentor. Uh, actually, in Japanese, they call it menta and use a, a writing form that they use for uh, words that were not originally uh, Japanese. But the concept is, is there and embedded, embedded in their culture, certainly, of getting guidance from one more senior to you. And they will say, try not to do that from someone too, too many roof tiles up from you. It's slippery, particularly when it's raining. You may slip and fall off. So they, they talk about this, this idea, they don't call it peer mentoring, but getting mentoring from someone one roof tile up from you. And this is a very familiar concept for us, of course, in medicine and medical training as well where you have the, you know, the senior resident mentoring potentially the junior resident or the junior faculty mentoring the senior resident or the fellows, et cetera. So certainly within our clinical training, this concept of peer mentoring is very embedded in our culture, I think as well in the research context. And we should think about how do we better support these peers, these often kind of informal peer mentorship relationships as well. <clears throat> Okay, with the rest of this definition, to share mutual responsibility and accountability. 
And this is a quote from Judy Zerzan's work in Chicago. She said, the mentee is not an empty vessel receiving the mentor's advice and wisdom, but rather an active per participant shaping the relationship. So just to get across the concept again of this mentee-centered mentoring, that in order for this to work, and, and obviously this may vary to a certain extent depending upon the level, you know, if you have a first-year medical student versus a junior faculty member, your expectations about how much you're going to take charge of the relationship initially is going to vary. But the, but the key role for a successful mentee is to figure out how to make that mentoring relationship work for them, and that requires skills and managing up. Again, an idea we can talk more about later, but I think a very important concept. And that may require some training. So as you think about implementing and rolling out more mentoring here, we want, want to not just kind of train up mentors and think about mentor competencies and knowledge, but also what does it take to be successful as a mentee. And then finally, clear and mutually defined learning goals. This is a key concept here. And alignment, this is all about alignment and mentoring relationships. And the reason why many mentoring relationships don't work, just like why this bridge is probably not going to work, is that there's lack of alignment in the relationship. This needs to take place early and often, and again, is, is very frequently the reason why there's dissatisfaction on both sides of that equation on by mentor and mentee. There's lack of alignment from the get-go. How do you know when there's lack of alignment? You know, I could have a list of 20 items, but here's a few things to, to give you clues. The mentee or mentor dreads mentoring meetings. Any of you ever experienced that? You know, you see it on your calendar uh, and you wish it wasn't there. A men mentor does not respond to emails, does not find time to meet, right? From the mentee's perspective, I've sent four emails trying to get my, him or her find time I'm not hearing back. There may be other barriers going on there, but this may be part of it also. The mentor is like, I'm not sure why I'm meeting with this person. Like, what are our goals? Where are we going with this project? A mentee doesn't follow through on deadlines. Mentor does most of the talking and direction setting during mentoring meetings. If you're the mentor and you find yourself doing most of the talking, that's not a good interaction. You should be mostly listening. We often think our role is to give advice and give direction, and therefore we're going to be pontificating most of the time. There's a role for that, but mostly we should be listening carefully and reflecting. I'll come back to that. And then finally, you know, the jumping in the closet when you see a mentor down the hallway. That's not a good, definitely not a good sign. <laughs> so how do, you, it, how do you avoid that misalignment? Because often it takes place too late. You realize a year in to working together, something's not right or six months. Uh, you need to find another mentor. I, sorry, I don't have time to work with you anymore. IDPs, the Individual Development Plan, which we can call kind of the career compass. I presume now most people have heard of this concept of the IDP. Raise your hand if you, you know what I'm talking about. So about half of you, maybe a little more, and about half of you, this is a new idea. Um, this is a really important concept, and it's, you know, NIH has now drunk the IDP Kool-Aid and are now requiring you know, some form of individual development plans for many of their career development awards. So whether you like it or not, I think you should like it, but whether you like it or not, you're going to need to get familiar with IDPs and start integrating them in to how you work with your mentees. So again, this could be a full couple of hours and really talking about it and working with it and be something you're going to want to integrate in to your mentor and many training here. But let me just tell you very one slide, what is an IDP for those of you who aren't familiar? And this was laid out, um, I think this is a nice way of thinking about it very simply. It's both a process and a product. Okay, the process is goal setting. You know, where do you want, where are you going with your life and your career? Very broad, but how are we going to get you there? Very specific steps along the way. We're all familiar with this, right? We used to walk around with, when John and I were back in residency, we'd walk around with a little three by five card and boxes that we would tick off, right, as we got stuff done. I don't think, I assume you guys don't do that anymore if you're a resident. There's probably some electronic way of doing that. Um, but the, the more specific, no? Still three by four? Okay, I love the three by five card. Um, the more specific, you know, the more actionable, short-term, measurable goal, the more likely it is to get done. So you want to help that, the role as a mentor is to help your mentee take these aspirations. I want to get an R01 in five years and figure out what are the skills, knowledge, steps you need to take to get there. 
and break that down uh, so that you have clear goals and that you know who's responsible on the mentor side, who's responsible on the mentee side. That's all an IDP is. It can be a very complex document. You can do it on the back of an envelope, potentially, but it's just some way of having this process, this discussion, to have this goal setting, this feedback, and it's an iterative process. Okay, it's a live document. You know, if you have it electronically, you want to keep it on your desktop so it's there, you can update it if you're the mentee. It's also a product, again, so it is a written document, and again, it answers these two critical questions that I alluded to. Where am I headed with my career, and how will I get there? I think the other question is, what do I need to get there? What am I missing? If, I want, if my goal is to have a, be the PI of an R01, you know, what quantitative skills am I lacking now that I need to acquire in the next few years that will help me be successful? So it's also about a self-assessment of your own knowledge and skills on the mentee side. And then with the mentor, how do I get these skills? What do you recommend? What, should I take, do this master's degree, sign up for this course, et cetera? You get the idea. This is one developed at UCSF. This is, I think, in many ways more relevant for basic science careers, but if you want to see sort of the, you know, the ultimate IDP, very, uh, very involved and detailed, I enc you know, encourage you to check this one out, and you can take bits and pieces from it. There are many others out there. We have a number on, on the UCSF CTSI website and the faculty mentoring program website, and I'm sure some of the, your leaders here have them as well. But this is a pretty neat website developed by Bill Lindstadt, Cynthia Furman at UCSF that you may want to check out, particularly if you're working with um, mentees in the more basic sciences. Okay, there are a number of mentoring roles and responsibilities. I've touched on some of them uh, over the course of the last uh, uh, 10 minutes or so, uh, but let me uh, disentangle them a little bit more. Mentors or teachers, again, the role is to educate the mentee, clinical teaching skills, but really, in many ways, primarily about professional values and behaviors. How do you succeed in this profession that you've chosen? And this is maybe the first known mentoring relationship. I had to scour the literature for this one. Uh, he's saying, there, now I've taught you everything I know about splitting rocks. So this is this sort of the basic goal, right, is transmission of knowledge and skills from one generation uh, to the next. Um, I'd probably fire this guy as a mentor, though, because the rocks look exactly the same, and we really want to mentor people to independence, you know? Split a different kind of rock um, uh, when you're, uh, when you're uh, uh, developing your career. Uh, mentors are role models, persons considered as standards of excellence to be imitated. Um, there was a recent study, it was just the um, role modeling role of the, of the mentor, those mentees who said they had a mentor role model, who seem to be more satisfied, professionally satisfied in their life. None of the other roles of the mentor um, actually led to more satisfaction. Interesting finding, not sure what to make of it, but I found it intriguing. It's an important role. This is one where, as the mentor, you're being closely observed by your mentee. You know, they're watching, just like you, you, those of you with uh, adolescent children, they're watching what you do. They're not necessarily listening to what you have to say. Uh, I'm sure you'll, you've all read Atul Gawande. I thought this was a lovely piece in The New Yorker a few years ago. He didn't mention the word mentor, but he talked about coaching and this aspect of a mentor, mentoring role. And he said, I've been a surgeon for eight years. For the past couple of them, my performance in the operating room has reached a plateau. I'd like to think it's a good thing. I've arrived at my professional peak, but mainly it seems as if I've just stopped getting better. Pretty interesting and profound stuff from him, as usual. And so this role of the mentor of helping us continue to improve, I'd say this probably goes on both sides of the equation, not only helping the mentee uh, continue to improve and get through self-reflection and get better, but through the act of being the mentor. I know all of you who have engaged in that as a mentor also find yourself needing to, if you're not doing that, reflecting on how you, at the very least, can be a better mentor. That should be part of the essential skills of a good mentor as well. We should all be looking for ways to continue to, to get better, right, in our professional and personal lives. And finally, the most exciting one, actually there's one more after this, but, but this is the most exciting one. This is Mentor as Superhero. This is from Marvel Comics, actually. I spend too much time Googling the word mentor, you know, and find all kinds of stuff. Um, but I thought this was interesting, at least maybe from the lay uh, perspective. 
Mentor is a member of an unidentified alien race who possess vast intelligence. Pressure's on. Um, but this is the role of the mentor as both protector and advocate, really, really important as well in any kind of setting. Even the most uh, warm and fuzzy and friendly academic setting can be tough, uh, particularly these days with the funding climate and everything else. So that role of the mentor is protector. Protege comes from protegere, or to protect, really embedded within that role and advocate, putting their mentee up for awards, saying, gee, I'd love to go to this conference, but I'm going to send you. I think this would be a wonderful uh, opp professional opportunity for you to go. Why don't you go and present the paper instead of me, etc." This role of the mentor, learning to kind of shrink down your own goals and own needs and, and advocate uh, for your mentee. And this last one, as mentor, as advisor, and guide, um, you notice the arrows go both ways here, again, coming back to the sense of communication and reciprocity. This is from the OED, the Oxford English Dictionary, of the mentor as a trusted counselor or guide. This is really, really important. Um, and this, this is the only relationship, I think, that we have in our in academic setting in which there's an opportunity for self-reflection and value clarification. You know, so at least once a year, if you're in a mentoring relationship, uh, and if the mentee is not bringing you up, encourage them to spend some time thinking about why are you doing this work? You know, why are you, why are you sitting here uh, in my office at UCSF in general medicine rather, seeing patients at, rather than seeing patients at Kaiser or in private practice or you know, the marine biologist that you always thought you would become or whatever it is? You know, what, what matters to you? And also in your personal life, because then as, you're, as a mentor helping to guide the mentee towards choices, if we pretend that all the choices are just in the professional domain and there's no need to think about and balance and incorporate in those personal values and those personal choices, uh, we're making decisions in a vacuum. And so it's an opportunity to think about all the things that are important to you. Is it spending time with my kids, making sure I'm I could be there for the school performance at 3 o'clock, uh, stability in my life and professional life. I really want to have six R01s. Whatever it is, um, you're going to have to make some choices and some sacrifices. Yes, these are first world problems, right? We're not worrying about uh, where our next meal is coming from. But still, these, are, these kinds of choices are what help determine our own personal and professional satisfaction in our lives. And the last thing any of us want is to look back 10 years later and have regrets about choices because we didn't take the time to reflect on what the values were that were, should be driving and underlying those choices. So this is another picture from Japan. It just We were walking in a garden in Kyoto. Usually they're fairly rule-oriented there uh, in Japan. And uh, I came, we came to a sign in this beautiful garden that said, this way, this way. And so I sort of stood there perplexed and took a photo of it, thinking that this is really a nice metaphor also for the role of a mentor, is to help the mentee decide which beautiful path they want to embark on. Um, generally, we don't have bad choices, but we have different choices. And so again, this career mentor is there to have the mentee ask fundamental questions. Where am I most irreplaceable? It's usually not at work. In fact, it's not at work from, for any of us, including the president. Why did I choose my profession? Where, where am I going? Uh, what are my values? And from there, making choices. So in terms of values, I thought I'd just throw you this one slide, because I think this is um, often an interesting little concept in mentoring relationships, which is this difference in values that are often implicit. Uh, particularly, I don't know how many uh, people want to admit to being baby boomers um, in the audience, uh, but we have this, us baby boomers, I think, this concept of sort of, and here's you know, the, the older white guy, right, with the briefcase and the suit, um, climbing the ladder of success. Right? And there's sort of one way up, and up you go, and you've got to pay your dues um, uh, early on, and there's probably somebody you know, stepping on your hands here and pulling at your feet here. Right? This is kind of a dystopian image of how to be successful. But I think many of us grew up in an era where there was a sense of, I remember mentoring I got early on from a faculty at uh, uh, UCSF. She was highly successful, and uh, she told me, you want to be, get ahead at UCSF, you get up at 4 or 5 o'clock in the morning and write every morning. I was like, oh, shit. <laughs> Why didn't they tell me that before they offered me the job? <laughs> um, 
um, I didn't do that, and I've done okay, you know. So, um, but there's a sense, and I must say, now that I'm in the role of division chief and negotiating with junior with millennials, or uh, or I, I don't know where where we're at now, generation-wise, maybe. Um, there's a sense, and I, I keep the bias in my head is, you you want to run the organization next year. Um, there's kind of a sense of I get a sense of impatience, uh, uh, and I, I know. Maybe some of that is true. I think values have changed. I'm also putting my own values out there, saying, gee, I struggled for 10 years before I asked anybody for anything. You know, I just kind of kept my head down and tried to do my job. I think there's a different attitude now, and in many ways it's refreshing and better. Um, but my own bias cre creeps in in this mentoring. And so it's to, take, make, to use self-reflection as a mentor to make sure that your own expectations, your own biases are not coloring how you're interacting. And this is taken really from Sheryl Sandberg. She has, in her Lean In book, has this, um, talks about this metaphor of the jungle gym instead of the ladder. Some of you may have read that. I thought it was a lovely, different way of thinking about it. And this is really true now, I think, in many ways in terms of mentoring uh, junior faculty in terms of success. There are many ways up. Oftentimes, people do want to you know, step sideways before they continue on, on their way up. There's often a fear if I, you know, if I go over here and not continue up, will I ever be able to continue back up, et cetera? And the answer always is yes. There's many ways to the top, and the other lovely piece, of course, is there's ways for other people to help pull you up here, and that's a little bit harder on the ladder. So you get the metaphor. I think it's a better one as we think about mentoring um, in, this, in this time. And this last skill, which I love, again, hearkening a little bit back to my time in Japan, this is from George Bernard Shaw wasn't from Japan, but that was over there. But he said that the single, single biggest problem in communication is the illusion that it has taken place. Right? We know, you know, we often have conversations, we're thinking about 10 different things. We're kind of talking, but we're not even, we don't even know what we're saying sometimes. We're so multitasking, right? And that concept has been over, uh, you know, talked about but I think an important one. So when you're mentoring, you really want to be present in the room, clearing your desk, you know, turning the computer monitor away from you, and really focusing on that relationship, whether it's a 15-minute brief check-in or an hour and a half meeting where you're really talking about you know, next steps in the person's career. Don't be distracted. And that goes on both sides of the equation. And so this kanji, this old Chinese character, um, uh, struck me as just perfect. This is the, the character for to listen, and it's made up of these parts, eyes, ears, full attention, and one heart. So to listen is to use your eyes and your ears with full attention and one heart. Pretty perfect. That's active listening. All right, so I wanted to tell you, I can pause, and actually I don't mind at all if there are questions or comments um, along the way. And while you're thinking, I'll take a sip of water. Yeah. In retrospect? Yeah, no, I, so I, I, and I've heard that, and often I've heard from faculty, gee, I thought I was mentoring this person for the last three years. Apparently, <laughs> you know, and that's the risk. <laughs> and I think that's the risk of it. So um, I think it's important, actually, to be very clear and explicit from the get-go. Because it's not only, uh, uh, is this, some, you know, are, are we entering into a mentoring relationship, but what kind of mentoring relationship? Are you looking for a career mentor? I may have time to do that. That means I'm happy to review your CV, review your IDP, sit down with you a couple of times a year, and talk to you about kind of your career and career course and where you're going. Um, if you're looking for a primary research mentor, where you know, you're going to probably need someone to meet with you a couple times a month and reviewing, I don't, I don't really have the time to do that right now. But I recommend you, know, you meet with Dr. Finn, because he's got a lot of time. And um, he, can do that. Uh, he can do that for you. Um, so I think that specificity at the beginning is key to making sure you have alignment between, because sometimes the expectation on your mentee's part is, you know, I'm going to uh, thank you so much for, you know, meeting with me, and they put, they pencil you in their calendar every week for the next year, and you had no idea that that was their expectation of the relationship. 
Um, yeah, an important question. So you talked about individuals that have talked about Yeah. Yeah. I, can you, I, you know, I haven't used them. I sometimes, the only way, I don't know if this is the same thing. Sometimes when I meet with residents who are very confused about kind of next steps, I have them go back and read the essay they wrote to get into our um, primary care residency program. Um, maybe my little hidden agenda there is to try to get them re-engaged in, in, uh, in, in primary care general internal medicine, but that kind of helps them think again about kind of what mattered to them. It might have been the last time they had sat down and reflected. But I've not used, I've, I've not, can you tell, tell me a little bit more about how you've used that? Yeah. yeah, that's nice. I guess the way we've now, um, we've used that often. We have resident retreats for a resident. We sometimes have them write those, those kinds of statements or do sort of their, their personal shield or other ways trying to reflect on and um, uh, what their values are. I think that's a, that's a nice concept uh, to integrate in, and that could be very much part of the IPT. Thank you. <coughs> So there are a few components of, the, of what we've done over really now over the last decade at UCSF um, to try to promote uh, and support mentoring a culture of what I've called a culture of mentorship at UCSF. The, um, the sense of a culture so that uh, I can now say that it's been three or four years maybe at least since someone's come up to me and said, oh, another unfunded mandate from the administration, mentoring, another unfunded mandate. Where, um, where I did hear that at the beginning, and I think now there's a sense that this is embedded in what we do. Of course, we have mentoring, we're supporting mentoring here at UCSF. Um, uh, this is kind of part of the fabric of the institution now in a very different kind of way than it was a decade ago. So part of that is a faculty mentoring program. We, um, we, uh, want all of our assistant professors to be paired with a career mentor. So we, this is uh, are targeted at the assistant rank faculty and more than 50%, so faculty who are kind of seeing their careers at UCSF. This is across all, you know, we have five series. Um, I don't know how many you have here at, at UW, but it can be a little bit confusing. Uh, but this is for faculty who are prim from primarily clinical to primarily research oriented and everything in between. So it's for all faculty. So which is why I've chose career mentoring and the basic mentoring for them. And this is in all four professional schools. Um, to get this done, obviously, I couldn't be pairing, you know, 900 assistant professors with mentors. So we have mentoring facilitators, leaders in each of the departments and divisions whose job it is to oversee their group and make sure that the assistant professors have a career uh, mentor. Um, I also will send letters every time there's a new hire, and we have many these days, it seems like, um, coming to UCSF at the assistant rank. We'll send them a letter welcoming them, introducing them to the department chair. Well, presumably they know the chair, but seeing the chair and the mentoring facilitator, and from the very beginning saying, you know, we value you being here, we value mentoring, your mentoring facilitator is going to find a mentor for you. So. From very, very early on, they're not feeling lost when they arrive at this big institution, which can be overwhelming for, uh, for many faculty. Um, out of 900 target mentees this past year, about 90% of them, we, and then we asked for the data. I don't just ask the facilitators to do it. I ask them to you know, send me the spreadsheet showing who the mentor is to, get, to hopefully get a little bit more validity about that this really happened. And the focus, again, is on career mentoring. Here's our website. You can just put UCSF Faculty Mentoring Program. It'll come up um, if you want to see. We have, we have some other tools and information there as well. Um, part of what we've done in terms of the mentoring program and changing the culture is, you know, I discovered early on somehow that uh, J January is National Mentoring Month. So thank you for having me here during uh, National Mentoring Month. Um, I appreciate it. Um, it's also National Dry Cleaning Month, I learned. But, uh, <laughs> So I did, I did have my suit clean before I came. Um, 
But this, um, this, this month actually, this just to show you what we're doing um, this month, and we have other activities over the year. I usually try to invite in an external speaker. This is Angela Byers Winston. Uh, there's been a lot of discussion at UCSF. I think we've, our medical students have been in the news through the white coats for black lives, et cetera. So I thought this year it'd be very appropriate to have Angela come and talk about race matters, building the 21st century clinician, educator, and scientist. And she's done a lot of work around mentor, importance of mentoring and diversity in, um, in health sciences education and other activities as well. You know, partly this is a nice education, partly this is nice uh, sort of PR, just to keep mentoring on people's minds uh, at the institution and the importance of mentoring. Recognition has been really important. I know I have the ladder here, I have to get rid of it, but um, we, 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 mentoring counts in advancement promotion at UCSF. So we have asked faculty, choir faculty, to document who they're mentoring on their CV. Um, and when the advancement promotion committees, executive promotion committees meet, they look at that. Uh, information. You know, if you're going, if you're a researcher and going up, going up for promotion, I can't say it's as important as having an R01 and writing lots of papers. Uh, but it's looked at, and particularly for researchers who may do very little or no classroom teaching, but spend a lot of their time mentoring. This is a way to quote unquote get credit for it as part of the promotion process. Symbolically, I think it's terribly important uh, move that we made a number of years ago. We also uh, created a Lifetime Achievement and Mentoring Award. Some of you may know Eliseo Perez Stable, who was kind enough to hand me over the division chief job six months ago. Um, and he's now at NIMHD and seen the verb. We couldn't, the committee couldn't decide this year, so we picked two people. Usually it's one. Um, and we have this big event, and the, the uh, chancellor comes and gives the award, et cetera. So another nice way of recognizing the importance of mentoring and having 150 people come to the celebration of mentorship on campus well, once a year. This is something else we did, six, uh, six words about race. You may have heard that campaign a couple of years ago. I took off on that and had six words about mentoring, about your faculty mentor, and we had all kinds of mentees send in um, things, and we put them in fortune cookies. I'm not sure why we did that, but it was a very cute idea. Uh, this one I love, she secures my rope, I climb. A uh, variety of uh, really nice pithy quotes about their mentors from from mentees. So, if we're going to you know emphasize mentoring, we um, we need to have some sense of what the competencies are. What are we training? Uh, what are the goals? Um, so, we've done a little bit of research in this area. This is one paper we published a few years ago on qualities of outstanding mentors. We actually we as part of that lifetime achievement and mentoring award. We had a bunch of letters nominating uh, mentors over many years. We had 100 letters of uh, nomination. We went back and did a qualitative analysis of those letters to see what kind of terms were coming out. What were the things that these mentees admired about their mentors? And the list is not terribly surprising in some ways. Time commitment, you know, we forget about that. But really, question number one, if someone comes to you or if you're a mentee, asking a mentor, will you mentor me? is do you really have the time to do it? You know, and sometimes many of us are in academic jobs because we love mentoring. This is why we do it, part of who we are. And we may think we're being kind by saying yes when we really don't have the time. So a big discussion early on is, this is what my needs are. Uh, are, you really, are you going to have the time to meet with me as frequently and have the mentor? So oftentimes maybe, you know, you say maybe, let me think about it, let me look at my calendar, let me reflect, you think about it, you meet with a few other people, we'll get back together in a, you know, a couple of weeks and decide whether this is gonna work. But time commitment, very, very, very basic and very important. Of course, nice personal qualities, enthusiasm, altruism, sometimes a piece of it, honest, honesty, trustworthiness, empathy, patience. These are nice things for a mentor to have and are appreciated by a mentee. Um, support for personal professional balance, you know, even these very high-powered uh, uh, research mentors who got the award, there are always things in their letters about how someone got pregnant or someone was ill in the family, et cetera, how they acknowledged that and integrated that into how they mentored that person. Always appreciated and key to being a successful mentor. And then, of course, expertise. We're not, again, doing any, any of our mentees any favors by saying we're going to help them on a research project when we don't have the, the methodologic content or content area, communication skills or other things that it's going to take to be successful. 
This is just a quote from one of the letters, which I like. During the launching of my career, she was like a solid rocket booster, ensuring that I achieved the lift and trajectory to make it into orbit. But rather than dropping off at that point, she has remained a constant feature like mission control, monitoring my progress. Sense of the continuity. And this, this came in from a um, um, former mentee who is now, you know, department chair somewhere. This was like a 20 or 30 year relationship that she was uh, commenting on about her mentor. Just have one slide on mentoring, diversity, and inclusion. This is a really, really important topic. Again, Angela, when she comes to UCSF, will spend an hour talking about this issue. I wanted to mention this as one of the key skills of a competent mentor is learning how to work across differences. Yeah, being able to work with a variety of mentors and, and mentees, and particularly paying attention to underrepresented minority students and faculty in medicine because this whole concept that I'm sure you're all aware with about implicit bias is, has, is holding back and, and creating an unlevel, even more unlevel playing field for many of these scientists. This is a well-known paper I'm sure you're all familiar with from Science by Ginther that found that African-American applicants were much less likely to be awarded an, an R01 with everything being the same except changing the race on somehow they were able to change the, the race or ethnicity on the application from, from white to, to African American. Um, and nothing else about the background, the educational background, the productivity, everything else was the same. So there was clearly an implicit bias in the reviewers going, going into that. This was a shocking paper to NIH and has led to a lot of um, initiatives, including the National Research Mentoring Network. I don't know how many of you have heard of the NRMN. Um, you can Google it and now look at, just look at their website. I've been out there several times on working with the folks in Wisconsin or the Mentor Training Corps. For those of you who are interested in really kind of training up your skills and becoming a, a train the trainer mentor, um, talk to me and I can tell you, introduce you to the NRMN. But the focus of the NRMN, again, is to uh, kind of support a more diverse biomedical research workforce, basically. And that's the, the goal of this very large grant from NIH. Um, other insight into kind of successful, unsuccessful mentoring skills and relationships, published this article in Academic Medicine a couple of years ago on failed and successful mentoring relationships. Here's the characteristics of successful mentoring relationships from this qualitative research. Reciprocity, interestingly, came out on top got to be a two-way street. It can't just be a one-way giving relationship, because then it's just going to burn out. Mutual respect, clear expectations. It's helpful to set up sort of those guidelines in the beginning, what the mentee can expect from the relationship, but also what the mentor expects. Again, of trying to avoid this misalignment. Personal connection and shared values. On the flip side, the failed relationships uh, as reported by mentors and mentees in the Department of Medicine at UCSF and University of Toronto. Poor communication, lack of commitment, personality differences, uh, competition or conflict of interest, which is obviously a real poisonous issue and uh, can be in academia. If there's any other agenda or ulterior motives, I think it can really poison the relationship because you're not sure if the advice you're getting is good for you or good for them. And then finally, this kind of loving your mentee to death instead of to life by taking them on when you don't have the experience, the knowledge, or the skills to really help them. You know, not doing anybody any favors then. And that's sometimes a, a mentor a opportunity for more senior mentors to mentor more junior mentors, those who are transitioning from assistant to associate professor, re ready to start taking on some mentees, some uh, guidance about what kind of mentee they're ready to take on what their role should be in that, in that project, et cetera, uh, so that they don't get, you know, get in over their heads, so to speak, um, from the get-go and do nobody any favors themselves or, or their mentee. So I wanna, want to leave about 10 minutes for uh, discussion, so I'll finish right on time. Um, I just wanna finish with two quotes and coming back to this idea of uh, values and choices um, Never mind, I've got a couple quotes before I get there. Um, <laughs> too many quotes, apparently. These are two quotes actually from the qualitative study. Um, this is from one junior faculty mentee. The role of the mentor, I think, is really to be a guardian angel 
that prevents you from getting hit when you know something is falling from the sky, keeps you out of trouble, and makes the environment suitable for you to grow. And this is another one about the guide. Mentors need to be guides, but also be sensitive to the difference between a guide and somebody who forces the mentee into a particular path. This is always the risk of fiddling with your slides at midnight. <laughs> um, we, uh, oh, and I just couldn't resist. I don't know if anybody recognizes this guy right here. He looks exactly the same to me now. But this was about 10 years ago, I think, John. Might have been the very first cohort of the Mentor Development Program. Uh, so this was the MVP as part of our CTSI. Pretty intensive five half day uh, program um, at, uh, for around mentor training. Um, Many, many, or maybe almost all of these folks have gone on to get K-24s and other uh, um, mentoring awards. We've been very, very successful at UCSF in that area, I think in part because of our mentor development program. Um, this 10 case based seminars over five months. I'm actually turning this into a web-based course now, a blended web-based in-person course, and hopefully we'll be exporting it, you know, allow those in overseas in China and Japan and other places also to do this in a web-based manner um, as well. So finally, sorry, assessment. Um, we've developed a 14-item way for mentees to evaluate their mentors. I'm hoping to get that paper submitted in the next couple of weeks, because uh, although we talk a lot about uh, when uh, needing to document your mentoring on your CV, having it included as part of advancement promotion discussions, We've not had any kind of objective metrics or way of evaluating that other than letters. And we have all kinds of evaluations around teaching, right? We're drowning in teaching evaluations, at least at UCSF, that may be true here also. Um, but nothing related, I'm not saying that's a bad thing, that's a good thing that we have that data, but we don't have any data around mentoring, and so we've created um, a way of doing that, and I'm happy to share it with you soon. And we've done some program evaluation couple of papers about our mentor development program that has found that the knowledge and the skills, um, the self-reported uh, in improvement in effectiveness last for three or four years in the folks who have gone through our mentor development program. We haven't asked them more than three or four years out. Um, when I've tried to make the change at UCSF, I'm very cognizant of the fact that not all departments, not all faculty, not all divisions are going to sort of drink the Kool-Aid at the same time. So I think also as you start implementing programs here, you know, look for early successes, look for champions, look for, uh, very important to have leadership be supportive. I was lucky at UCSF to have the chancellor kind of push this initiative 10 years ago um, from some needs assessment surveys. But you wanna be um, rolling this out in ways where you can create models of excellence while you're also trying to bring everybody else along so that this gets integrated throughout all of the uh, School of Medicine. All right, here are my two quotes. So this is from Jim Collins from the business world. He said, for in the end, it's impossible to have a great life unless it's a meaningful life. And it's difficult to have a meaningful life without meaningful work. And I would argue that it's difficult to have meaningful work without meaningful mentoring relationships as part of that work environment. And then I'll end with my, my favorite quote of all time. This is from John Gardner, who's a founder of Common Cause. And again, coming back to this idea of meaning and he said, meaning is not something you stumble across like the answer to a riddle or the prize in a treasure hunt. Meaning is something you build into your life. You build it out of your own past, out of your affections and loyalties, out of your own talent and understanding, out of the things you believe in, out of the things and people you love, out of the values for which you're willing to sacrifice something. So thanks so much for your attention.